Good morning. We'll get started. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunity we have to come together and to worship you. We pray, Father, that we can clear our minds this morning of um, all that may be troubling us or all that may be on our minds and focus on worshiping you, praising you, encouraging one another and uh, growing in our knowledge and understanding of who you want us to be and how to use and apply your word in our lives. Father, we're thankful for uh, each one that's gathered here in this class this morning. We pray, Father, that as we talk and share about your word that we can... um, Come to see the truth that you want us to see, the things that you want us to uh, glean from the text, and understand how we can take that and use it and apply it in our lives to become the men and women you want us to be. Father, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful for the power that it has, the encouragement it provides, the strength and help that we can gain, especially as we allow the Spirit to um, direct our thoughts and guide us and uh, to, to see how we can grow to be more like you. These things we pray through Jesus. Amen. So we're in John chapter 15 this morning. <clears throat> and a couple things uh, as, we, as we get started in, in John 15 is... Uh, you may or may not uh, know or think about, but I think it's helpful uh, to keep them in mind as we're reading, especially the first uh, few verses of John 15, which is, I think, what we'll probably spend uh, the majority of our time on. And that is that the imagery of the vine or of a vine is used. Um, throughout Scripture, and specifically, the the vine here is almost certainly that's being considered almost certainly is a grapevine, and that imagery is used. Good morning. That imagery is used throughout Scripture, and quite often it is used in a reference to the nation of Israel. Um, a sampling. Of that, and maybe a passage that's worth our consideration uh, is in Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah writes, I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug up, dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it, cut out the wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Now I will tell you what I am going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall, and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland. Neither pruned nor cultivated nor briars and, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are the garden of his delight. For he looked for justice but saw bloodshed, for righteousness but heard cries of distress. Isaiah 5, the first seven verses. That's an example of where... Uh, the vine was used in reference to Israel and, and the entire nation of Israel, Israel and Judah. And uh, probably, um, well, I, I, I think it is fair to say that there is um, some aspects of um, not only prophecy current day to Isaiah's time about what God was saying was going to happen to Israel, but, but perhaps some allusions uh, to Jesus, um, or at least I think it's fair that we can make that connection for the text that we're going to look at today. And that leads me to my second point. You know, John, we've talked about, John has some unique things about the way he writes and presents things in his Gospels as compared to the synoptics. And one of the things that John does that is different 
is John will repeatedly use a, a, a phrasing, words, imagery over and over and over again in a, in a way that is just different. He does it so much that it's different. And one of the things that he does is he contrasts Jesus from who Jesus says he is or who Jesus is from that which is perceived as ordinary or regular or might be seen in other ways in other, in other parts of Scripture or other parts of life. For example, <clears throat> in chapter 1, he refers to Jesus, excuse me, he refers to Jesus as the, the true light. John was the forerunner to Jesus, and John was a light, but Jesus was the true light. In John chapter 6, um, Jesus is described as the true bread. In John chapter 17, which we'll get to in a couple of weeks, when Jesus is praying, Jesus is referred to as the true God. And here, in our text today, in John 15, Jesus is referred to as the true vine. He's not a vine. He's not that vine. He's the true vine. And so this contrast <clears throat> for light, bread, the vine, um, and, and God is intended, John intends to draw this contrast to say that Jesus is authentic, true. He's the real thing. He's the ultimate. He is the essence of what those characteristics are. Now, you know, as a side note, and I don't, I don't want to go too far afield here, but one of the important things, I, I think one of the important things that um, I have learned in, in studying Scripture is to recognize the fact that when, when I think of myself or when I think of another person and I say, hey, they are, they are a good person or they are a kind person, or they um, love people well. I am describing characteristics or attributes of that individual or of myself, but they're characteristics or attributes that I reflect or I exhibit from time to time. I might, my goal might be to do it all the time, but I do it from time to time because I'm fallible. God, Jesus, they don't just exhibit characteristics. And I would contend, you know, we, we know that, but I think it's a mistake to think that, well, Jesus just exhibited all the same characteristics that I do. It's just that he did it all the time. I, I would contend that's not a correct way to think about God and Jesus. Rather, I would submit to you that it is their essence. That's who they are. Jesus, is, Jesus does not demonstrate love to people. Jesus is love. Jesus does not go around doing good deeds. Jesus is good. And so when John talks about Jesus is the true vine, it's not just that, well, he's a better vine than anybody else, or he is a perfect example of the vine and all that he does. He is the vine. He is the true vine. Now you may think, well, is that a, that's a distinction without a difference, but I think that there is a pretty significant difference there. Um, the, the God is the essence. Jesus is the essence of all that exists. I am merely a reflection of that essence. In, in, on my best days, I am maybe an adequate reflection of that essence. And, and I think that's important because I think that's what John is trying to get his readers to see, is that don't think of Jesus as just a better version of us. He's not a better version of us. He's not a perfect version of us. He is 
Now, that probably made you feel uncomfortable because you thought I was going to say he is something. But see, my point being, that's the claim that Jesus made in John chapter 8 when he said, I am. He didn't need to put a qualifier on there. He is. And that's what is being communicated here in John 15, and John is communicated throughout his gospel. And so I think keeping those two things in mind, that Israel is, has been referred to throughout Scripture as the vine, uh, a, a poor example of a vine oftentimes. And then the second thing is this whole idea about Jesus, John referring to Jesus as the true whatever, and ultimately understanding that in the context of that's the essence of who Jesus is. So, if you'll join me in John 15, beginning in the first verse, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If any man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, Ask whatever you wish, and it will be given you. This is my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So, in in this, uh, however you want to think about it, I I don't know that it really matters whether you think of this as um, an allegory or an extended metaphor, that it, but in, in the, the story that Jesus is, what he, what he or not story, but the uh, description that he is giving here, let's set up the characters. <clears throat> Jesus says that he is the vine. And then who else does he introduce into his allegory? What, what are we? What, what were the people, the, the, the disciples? Let's, let's put it in terms of them. What were the disciples in, in Jesus' allegory? They were the branches, okay. And then who, who else is introduced? The gardener. Yeah. In, in, the, in the first verse, um, <clears throat> it's my, my understanding that there's that word that's translated gardener in the NIV. Does the ESV say gardener? Vine dresser, okay. Um, that, that that word in, in, the, in the Greek is the word that would normally be used for farmer. But in this case, the, uh, the translators in many, especially of the maybe the newer translations, have adopted either vine dresser or gardener, I think are the two most common ones, um, to reflect the fact that he is talking about this in the context of a vineyard, and that's the way it would have been intended by Jesus. He is a farmer, but he's a farmer who specifically deals with tending grapes. Okay, So uh, that, that, that meaning is, is pretty clear. That is God, God the, Jesus' Father. The Father is the vine dresser. So we have God as the one who is over the whole plantation, over all that's going on. We've got Jesus is the vine, and the disciples that are hearing Jesus' message are the branches. What is the purpose, what do you think would be the vine dresser's purpose in planting um, grapevines? That really is an easy question, <laughs> not intended to be tricky. What, what's the purpose? 
Yeah, to, to, to produce fruit, to produce grapes in this case. <coughs> That's the reason that the, that the plants exist. Now, what does Jesus say in the allegory is necessary for the fruit to be grown? It got to stay connected to the vine. If if you're not connected to the vine, then you're not going to grow. Okay, we, you know, we understand that. If we had grapevines grown in our backyard, and you went out with a weed eater or um, snips or anything else, and you whack off a bunch of the branches or shoots from the vine, you wouldn't just leave them laying there and expect that you're going to have grapes growing on them and we'd say well that's laughable of course that's true but that's the point that Jesus makes is the same is true with me if you're not connected to me then you're not going to bear fruit now I guess the question is um, and this might be one that might be subject to some um, debate or discussion but what is what is the fruit that Jesus is um, alluding to in this passage. The fruit of the Spirit? Okay. What, what, what makes you say that? Good. I, I want to. That's good. I want to come come back to that. Other thoughts, ideas. Yeah. Yeah. N- normally, <clears throat> the reason I ask that question is, I say normally, a lot of times when we see, uh, well, I think this is true. It may not be true of the people in this room, but on the whole, when we see, talk about bearing fruit, we see that in the scripture, that oftentimes people leap to, that means producing disciples. You know, it's, an, it's in an evangelistic context in which we think of bearing fruit. I don't want to say that that's not what Jesus had in mind here, but I don't think that that's the primary thing that Jesus had in mind here. I don't think in his mind he was thinking, well, you need to go out and produce disciples. I think what he had in mind here is more in the line of the things that, that, uh, that Brian and John have shared, and that's the focus of what he's talking to his disciples about, knowing, understanding full well that if those things are present, then the result very well may be and will be uh, changed lives. <clears throat> you know, an, an example... And then I want to dive into those a little bit. An, an example of that, and, and the reason that I say that is um, even supported within John's gospel. You know, cha- back in chapter 13, what does John say will happen if his disciples, and therefore us, what, will, what does he say will happen if we show true love for one another? In verse... 34, 35, 33. Yeah, everyone's going to know you're my disciples. 
That is going to be a testimony to the world that you are my disciples. So Jesus is going to be teach. Jesus is going to be made known to the world by our behavioral changes that are affected by a life connected to the vine. You know, John, John makes that clear in several different cases, but that's, that's a very notable one. And, and so I think that then brings us to <clears throat> um, the, the, the idea that, that Brian and John brought out, which are, which are um, you know, connected in the sense that I think Jesus is, is telling his disciples that the fruit that will be born if you have a life connected to the vine is going to be fruit that is going to be evidenced in your life through changes that will come about. And if you think about that in an ecological sense, um, isn't that what happens to, uh, you know, in, in, we see that in nature? You know, you don't, you don't, you don't plant a grapevine and poof out of the ground it comes and it's a big giant vine and grapes are growing on it. That's not the process. You know, a baby is not, well, uh, change my terms, a human being does not come forth full grown. There's a process by which it grows and develops. Flowers, you know, are planted and grow and bloom. We, we see that cycle in nature. Trees, you know, grow into something bigger. Um, that, that same thing is true in the Christian life, and I think that that is what um, part of, I, I don't think that that is a stretch to read that into what Jesus is teaching here, is in an ecological and an ecosystem, there is growth and development. And if there's connection to the vine, then there is going to be fruit that is going to grow. If you disconnect from the vine, the vine's going to wither and die, and it's not going to produce fruit. And so if we want to grow and develop and develop the fruit of the Spirit in our life, if we want to grow and develop and strengthen in our prayer life and our connection, our relationship to God, the only way that's going to happen is to stay connected to God. If I'm not talking to God, then I'm not going to grow in my relationship to God. You know, if you don't believe that, you know, stop talking to your husband, wife, children, friends, co-workers, and just don't talk to them for two or three weeks, and then see how that goes. That's, you know, sarcastically, that obviously that's not going to work. And we understand that in human relations, but we sometimes forget that, you know, with God. But, and, and I think Scripture you know, teaches us, and here again, not to get too far afield, but I think Scripture teaches us that this idea of prayer, um, you know, c talking to God, it, is really is a two-way street, even though we think of it as one-way communication. Um, I, I, I believe that there is a, um, a reciprocal aspect of it. I believe that God, um, through my communication to Him, God give something back to me, um, not necessarily just in the vein of what I've asked for, but I believe there's a strengthening or growing of the relationship, um, and, and that uh, can come in many forms. And we can save that discussion for another day, but the point is, in this passage, I think it's really important that we recognize that growth only comes by being and staying connected to the vine, but that growth, that fruit that it's going to yield, is going to be... Is gonna be um, realized through uh, changes in our life, changes in how we um, act, changes in how we think, and changes in all that we do. And that really is what Jesus has in mind by their ability uh, to, bear, to bear fruit. And evangelism, I think, and I think the text would support this, uh, the scripture as a whole would support this, Evangelism is really going to be a, uh, a, a byproduct or a, a, an offshoot of that. If my life is not changed, then I'm going to have a difficult time um, being able to impact another life. Yes?
Um, yeah, yes, I, I, be, I, be, I think it is fair to say that the, um, my actions that are done to try to be pleasing to God are going to um, be, uh, be a tool that can work in someone else's life to help them recognize God. You know, repeatedly, Paul in particular says, you know, hey, be imitators of me as I am of the Father. And that's really, you know, what, what we're doing when, I, when I'm living, when you're living out our faith and someone sees that, then that's going to have an effect on them. It may not have the desired effect because they may choose to reject it, but they can't ignore it. So I don't know that the, the actions are, are, are fruit and they will produce whether they produce a good result or a bad result, it's not up to me to define the result. God will define the result, but it's up to me to produce the fruit. And the fruit is, is, is um, I suppose it can be my good actions, but more significantly, it's the heart from which those actions emerge. Does that make sense? I just want to be careful to separate um, hey, I do a lot of good things, and that, therefore that's the good fruit. I think the good fruit is the heart from which that, those actions emerge. The, the actions themselves are, 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 are in, a, in a context with God, I don't know that they're, they're neither good nor bad, because somebody could be, there, there were good things that were done by people that were very evil in Scripture, but I think it's the heart from which that emerges, and the heart does that with a goal to try to help shine that light, be the ambassador. And that's why all those words that are used in Scripture is, you know, let your light shine and be an ambassador, be a representative. So to answer your question, to, to come back and boil it down, is I think the good things that we do are coming from a heart that is bearing good fruit. And those actions are merely a reflection of that that then God can use to attempt to reach or touch other people. Right. Yeah, and, and and as long as we yeah, as long as we are truly connected to him, you're right. I mean, uh, you know, a a um, grapevine's going to grow grapes, a peach tree is going to bear peaches, an apple tree is going to bear apples. It is going to bear after its kind as long as there's not been um any um uh, crossbreeding. Well, I, but, but 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 I mean, but you know, and, you, and you're right. We we don't want to make it too complicated. But 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 I will say, I do think that there are people in our world, though, that will say, "I am connected to Jesus," but I'm also connected to something else, and then they wind up with a hybrid. And and so I I do think when we say when we also need to be careful when we say, "I am connected to the vine," that means I am connected to the vine. I'm not connected to the vine and six other things. I am connected to the vine, and I am not suffering from cross-pollination. I mean, you know, because if you've planted crops, you've probably had that. You plant cucumbers and peppers next to one another, you're going to have cucumbers that are going to be a little bit spicy. It's hap I've done it, witnessed it before. And so, not, not, I agree with what you're saying, but I do think that, the, the, that it, it is important to rec recognize that that connection to the vine absolutely has to be that connection to the vine and not anything else because we will find a way to rationalize ourselves into, well, yeah, I'm, I'm connected to Jesus, but no, it's I'm either connected to the vine or I'm not. That is the simple truth of the matter. <laughs> That, that is, that, that, that is, but that is a good point. You know, the fruit is going to be the result of that, that which I'm connected to. And, and if I'm not truly connected to the vine, then the fruit's not going to be reflective of that vine. And, and I think, you know, <clears throat> I go out on Sunday, and, you know, based on how I'm dressed, some people would say, oh, it's connected to the vine. Obviously, came to church. Today, and then on Sunday, if you're interacting with people, and hopefully at a very special,
Yeah, I, I, yeah, I understand. The, uh, I, I, I think, though, that, you know, to connect sort of what you're saying back to the comment that Phil made, the, 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 branches, the branches on uh, that, that come from the vine don't have to really worry too much about if they're going to bear fruit if they remain connected to the vine. The, the vine will supply that which is needed to grow the fruit. And so, to me, if I'm seeking relationship with the Father and I'm trying to stay connected with the Father, then I think God, I don't have to worry about, well, is God really doing what He said He's going to do? Am I really doing enough? I, it will happen because I am connected to Him. So, so I mean, I, we, we, you're, you're right. We don't need to, we, we can't give it short shrift but I'm thinking if I'm doing what God wants me to do, I can trust and be confident that God is going to produce a work in me and he's going to change me. He's going to make fruit come forth of my life. And I don't have to think about it. And I don't really have to do a whole lot to make that happen other than stay connected to him. Um, you know, that, that's the, the um, I, think, I think that's the, um, the key point that John is driving at. You know, if you, if you want to make it real simple in our house, if, if I assume the infallibility of electricity, um, if I want to gain power to something, I just have to plug the cord in. That's what I have to do. Once I plug the cord in, the power is going to flow, and I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to fret about it. I don't even have to understand it. I just know I plug it in, and I've got power. Um, in the same way, in a spiritual context, when I'm plugged in, connected uh, to the Father, then I am going to have that growth um, that, that it will produce fruit. What do you think? Yeah. All right. Uh, when, when Jesus makes a statement <clears throat> um, in the, in the uh, section that we read, down in verse um, 7, when he said, uh, ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you. What, what, do you, what do you think that means? We'll, we'll touch on that here in the last couple of minutes. Or maybe a minute or so. What, what do you think that means? Okay. And, and what does that assume? What, is there something that may be assumed in that prayer request within the context here? <clears throat> No, I, 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 I agree with what you're saying, uh, but within this context, then what, what, what would be understood about that request? Yeah, I, I, I think more what, what's intended here in context is, is that if I am connected to Jesus, if I am connected to the vine, and I am praying that my life will produce the fruit the way the Father wants it to, and I will remain a healthy part of the vine, and Father, you'll help me, um, you know, if I want to metaphorically say, Father, help nothing to disconnect me from the vine, that God will do that. I think that's the context in which this is. is it's, it's the the branches and the vine that maintain that connection, praying and, and God giving me whatever um, I desire with respect to that relationship. You know, Father, I am struggling to find peace in my life. Help me to find peace. Father, I'm struggling to see you working in my life. Help me to see and to know that you're working. Father, I'm struggling because I um, uh, find myself getting angry or being discontented or whatever. Please help me to be more connected to you so that those things can be rooted out of my life. That's what I believe that text is getting at. It's not an open-ended promise to anything I ask God he's going to do for me. It is what he's going to do for me in the context of my relationship and connection to him as um, being connected to the vine. 
Um, that, that, and, and the reason I wanted to touch on that is I think sometimes people latch onto that phrase and they take it as being anything and everything. And I don't, I don't think that's what's intended in this context. But I think it is a rich promise, a rich promise within this context. Appreciate everyone being here. Appreciate your comments. Have a great week.